Hello, uh, my name is Neil Young. I'm the Managing Director of Elixir Energy, an ASX-listed energy company, and we're very pleased to be talking to you again, Matt. Neil, good to see you. We haven't seen you for a while, so we're back in uh, July. Uh, tumultuous markets at the moment, um, but you are making a few moves, uh, and not least the acquisition since I last saw you in, in, in Queensland. Um, and, and, and we'll get onto that, I, I promise, uh, in a second. But I've, I've got to ask you, what on earth is going on in the oil and gas markets at the moment? Well, I think the most interesting phenomenon is the bifurcation of oil and gas. Now, generally over history, gas has been worth less than oil. It's harder to move around and uh, less energy dense. But now we see significant premiums for gas in international markets over oil. And I think that reflects the role of gas in uh, electricity systems as an unmatchable glue that binds the whole system together, uh, fertilizers, chemicals, no other replacements. And of course, with one of the world's largest international suppliers, in effect, um, pulling out of the supply chain, that has dramatically changed gas markets and, and we think for, for quite the long term. How, now, how are the finance markets um you know, playing this because we hear sort of a lot of sort of anti fossil fuel rhetoric. We're seeing a lot of ESG rebadging from funds uh, and, ba- and banks alike. Um, is it easy to raise capital for what you're doing in the in the, in the gas market? I guess gas is is it being labelled as a, as, a, as a as a green energy source now? Maybe oil's a slightly different proposition. How, how does it work? I, th- I certainly think gas is greener. And indeed, I think there's been recognition by the EU of that role. And what what governments, of course, see is that uh, when you're philosophizing about the long term, you can uh, uh, take a very uh, green view. But when you're faced with a crisis of a lack of supply, and and in Europe, we're going to really see that this winter, then you realize that fossil fuels are not yet replaceable. And uh, obviously, I hope in due course that they will be. But I believe that the nature of the laws of science are such is that that in due course will be will be decades rather than years right and then with regards to what's going on sorry about this kind of thesis but because it's 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 just ever changing i think people but people understand the kind of the, the thesis and the kind of um global machinations of the the energy market at the moment um russia ukraine situation changing on a weekly basis seems like ukraine making some advances um at the moment russia talk talking the game of shifting oil and gas into China, also down to India, buying it in, in large quantities at the moment. I mean, how does that affect your Mongolian business if the gas is going to be pumped east? So oil is very fungible. We saw after the start of the war that um, oil markets adjusted. Um, oil is very portable. You move it around on boats and uh, if one country doesn't want to buy it from another country, then, hey, another country will stick its hand up and say, give me a discount and I'll buy it. And that's what we've seen with, with oil markets rebalancing and, and hence prices retracing. Uh, what we see in gas, though, is fundamentally different. Gas that goes currently from northern Siberia to Europe or, or, or in reduced quantities, to take that to China would take about 10 years of engineering and commercial negotiations. Even if you can do it, because with the absence of Western technology, developing new gas sources uh, in Russia will be hard. So the switcheroo is uh, easy to arm wave about, but it's very hard to do. So what that means in, in Mongolia is really twofold. That is, if I'm a Chinese buyer, I will naturally talk to the Russians, but I won't trust them. I will demand a low price, and but if a, a, a neighbour who is much closer and who I uh, is not in a position to 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 act uh, uh, as the Russians have, then I'll see that as being a very reliable and secure source of gas. So we think the the war has in fact uh, increased the value of immediately proximate gas in Mongolia to Chinese markets. That, okay, that, that that's interesting. So in, in coming back to your, the word that you used earlier, bi- bifurcated. Um, do you continue? Do you see that continuing, um, g- given, given that kind of new paradigm that you've described? Yeah, I, I think it'll endure to the medium and long term because of the sort of time frames that I mentioned. And in Europe itself, once a country's proven itself to be an unreliable supplier, 
people are going to take a long, long time to come back, even if there was beneficial political change, which, uh, of course, we'd all like to see, but um, there are many factors that might weigh against that. So I see Russia's taken itself out of European supply and hence global supply for the long term, and the rebalance from that uh, will take a while. And that, that rebalance is, is seen, obviously, in America with lots of LNG plants being built. And we think our new Queensland acquisition is a very uh, a quick and nimble response to that changing market scenario and uh, uh, one that hopefully our shareholders can benefit substantially from. Okay, well, let's, let's go there. Um, so you, have you made that decision to go to Queensland, Australia uh, and pick up this acquisition purely based on, I guess, Richard Cotty's experience there with, with Queensland, Queensland Gas uh, Corporation? Is it a opportunistic or is it a defence mechanism because the uncertainties that you you um, perceive may happen in Mongolia with this kind of whole new uh, Russia-Chinese uh, relationship and, and what that may do in pricing and therefore you know your your ability to make money? So I think the, the primary driver is opportunistic. Uh, our technical team are pretty experienced guys and, and they know the Tarim Trough play, which was first drilled by um, QGC uh, when it was owned by BG. QGC was a company that uh, Richard Cotty, our chairman, took to a five or six billion dollar takeout by, by BG Group. And of course, BG is now owned by Shell, who are still there. So the opportunistic uh, uh, driver wasn't really geology, the geology was sort of known. It was that the international events have raised gas prices in Australia and internationally for, in our view, the long term. Um, the acreage that we've targeted uh, was held by a, a private company and uh, it was opportune for them to sell with someone with a bigger balance sheet and for us to acquire something far more quickly than a company like, like Shell or its peers could ever do. Um, defensive aspects is, is much less, but still there. I think it's sensible for any company to to have an array of assets that recognise um, geology and geopolitical risks. Right. So th this property we're talking about is sort of to the uh, west west of Brisbane uh, in Queensland. Um, you you're surrounded by shell. Um, I'm trying to work out, you know, what what the play is here for you because you know if you're you're surrounded on three, uh, three sides by by shell. Um, well, actually, tell you what, tell us about the terms of the deal. I mean, how much does this actually cost you? I want to know what the, what the proposition is. So we acquired a private company that uh, has this permit, which is quite large and situated over the Troom Trough. Uh, the acquisition price was half a million dollars in cash, three million dollars in company stock, and a royalty over the liquids only component of any future production. And it's primarily a gas play. Uh, so a pretty good deal in a success case for the vendor, who, as I say, private company uh, and for us one that we could afford and not one that we can afford to take on through the uh, next stage of an appraisal well. Um, if that appraisal is successful then in our view this asset will ultimately end up in the hands of people like Shell uh, and I think the key challenge for oil and gas stocks in particular given ESG and other drivers is to have an asset that ultimately can attract capital uh, and large company interest. Right, okay, so this is a, this is a, this is a kind of condensate play. You haven't paid much for it. Um, how much money are you committed to spend on it in terms of the appraisal well phase and beyond? Are there kind of are there any kind of clawbacks from uh, the private company either? So no, no clawbacks. The, the deal is, is just as I said, with no, no extra kickers. Um, the uh, nature of the commitments under the Queensland Petroleum Licence are that we have to drill one well. I mean, we haven't said to the market yet what that well will cost. It, it's, it's fairly deep well, so it'll be considerably more expensive than the, the coal seam gas wells that we do in Mongolia. But we think that there are multiple ways to mitigate that cost through, for instance, farming out to a partner. Uh, and, and we think that the farm out market for this type of asset in a safe country connected to international markets will be will be very, very strong. But that's only one option to 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 finance the cost of this quite deep well. Right. Yeah. Well, I guess like you're what have you sort of 170 million market count company. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's been a, it's been a sort of difficult um, couple, a couple of years um, and you know, people have reacted well to the to the acquisition but the, the funding bit is i guess the the long pole in the turn in the sense that yes farm out 
Um, how do those things typically get structured? Because deep wells cost a lot of money, and if you miss with the first one, the market can be unforgiving. So what type of partner would you be looking for in terms of their balance sheet or um, technical expertise? I think certainly uh, we'd be looking for someone with a considerably larger balance sheet than ours. Technical expertise, not as relevant because we can operate the first few wells here ourselves. Um, and then if successful, then the ultimate ownership of the play will, will, will work itself out. Um, the, the type of parties that could be included given the international market dynamics could be LNG buyers in the traditional Australian markets of, of East Asia, such as Japan and Korea. But I think that in addition, as a potential European leg opened up, you could see, for instance, German buyers who would never normally look in a country like Australia are now very much incentivized to do so. There, the countries like Germany are installing substantial LNG import infrastructure, as are other companies in Europe. So the universe of potentially interested parties with big balance sheets is much, much larger than it would have been 12 months ago. And so how does that work? I know they're building big LNG infrastructure, but they've also got to think about what is Elon Musk's phrase about trying to move molecules as short a distance as possible um, in this green economy in which, we, which we're in. Going to the other side of the world doesn't seem very logical. So there have been one or two physical cargoes of LNG go from Australia to Europe already. But ultimately what happens is that you swap out cargoes. And so Qatar cargoes going to East Asia would, would, would instead you know, head west. So that's, that's logically how it does. So to that extent, gas mar markets are fung fungible. Um, you know, once you've actually got the liquefaction capacity um, available to put on boats and, and move those boats around. Right, so given, given this quite simple model and potentially you don't use your own balance sheet or have to raise capital to do this yourself with a, with a farm out and given, I guess, Mr. Cossey's experience in Queensland, will there be more targets? Will there be more acquisitions um, uh, happening? Um, because it's a slightly different business model than one that you, you've been running with so far. So uh, naturally, we, we look at various opportunities as they come up, but so they, they need to benefit as do this one from our existing skills. And those skills, as you say, relate to the capabilities of our directors as well as our technical team. Um, so we, we will look at things and it could be some, some add-ons and we, we've got some thoughts about that. But uh, you know, clearly we don't uh, stop loving our, our first-born children in, in Mongolia, uh, the CBM and, and the, the slightly newer um, hydrogen business. Um, and, uh, but I think the nature of a resources company is that it takes assets forward using its skills, it passes them on to, to parties at various times. There is a, the possibility, shock horror, of, of occasional failure due to geology or whatever, um, and having a suite of assets mitigates uh, against that. But ultimately, we, we, we'd like everything to win, and uh, we, think, we think the more that you build bridgeheads, then the more accretive opportunities come forward. And, and uh, even since we announced this just over a, a week or so ago, we've had various parties uh, coming up to us with their uh, cunning plan in, in the Baldrickian and, and hopefully uh, sensible senses. Right, okay, because, uh, how, because the, market, the market has kind of struggled with the whole kind of Mongolia uh, jurisdiction, right? I, 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 think that's, I think that's fair to say. It's been, it's been a, a, a difficult and hard slog in the sense that people need to wrap their heads around Mongolia. So it's sort of, for most investors, slightly unconventional, albeit a very ripe and, sort of, uh, and, and, and fertile ground. It's the, it's, it's getting, people need to get used to it, right? So Australia really, really helps with that. Would you, uh, sorry to stick on this, this M&A route, because I just think it's a sort of interesting, slightly, it's, it's quite an efficient model in a, in a way. Um, is Australia um, the only jurisdiction that you will look at, um, or are you looking elsewhere in the world? Because it feels like after you know five quite painful years in the gas markets and, and, and oil markets, it, it, there's a there's a lot of, kind of stranded assets around. If you can one raise the money and two buy efficiently, and three put the team to actually do something about it. Well, clearly, we, we want to look where we've got some competitive advantage, and, and you know, my, my sort of 11 years or so in Mongolia hopefully gave us something of that there. Uh, our broader team in Australia keep, clearly gives us some insights and connections and advantages here. So to, to go somewhere else with, with less uh, connections is not impossible, but needs to have a higher hurdle. 
I think that also the market would want us to pass a few milestones on the, on our current asset plans before uh, you know uh, allowing us to to go and run off and for instance you know buy something in in the states or or, or wherever. So uh, I think that uh, two countries is enough for just now. But to, you know never say never. And uh, I think the background of our chairman and myself and uh, our team is that recognizing the opportunity comes along uh, as it did for this deal. And one of your advantages as a small company is an ability to seize it rather than have three years of committee meetings before you can make a decision on it. Right. Okay. Well, let's let's, let's go. Let's go up to Mongolia. Um, so, um, Nongon um, project. How are things uh, progressing? Because you know there have been some problems because the Chinese border closed because of their um, rather uh, aggressive stance on, on COVID, etc. So, moving equipment in and out, people in that has been difficult. So, are things um, back to normal? Still not, still not back to normal, and the Chinese border still faces issues. But uh, over the passage of time, the friction has somewhat reduced, but it is still, it's still material. And um, that certainly led to some logistical uh, management challenges to bring in all the equipment and personnel needed for our first extended production test, which has just kicked off and we announced recently. We've spud the first of two uh, pilot wells there, which are substantially uh, uh, wider uh, diameter wells than before and involve a whole process of installation of, 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 of casing and pumps and ponds, etc. And uh, we plan over the next few months to um, flow fluid from those wells and ultimately flow gas that, uh, sh if at uh, commercial quantities, which obviously we uh, hope to be the case, will prove up the first reserves of gas in the country. Right. Okay. So the, the commercial bits, the, the bit where people's ears prick up, because it doesn't sound we're talking uh, like a very long um, time frame. So because you, you were everything we've talked in the past about the um, progressing the gas fired uh, generation project with with the government um so what what time, what time frame are we talking about here so the the, the flow test should uh, even by the end of this year deliver a result or, or or feed into q1 next year and presuming that result is favorable then uh, we will uh, pursue the plans that we have been engaging with the government on about a small scale generator, small scale really reflecting that this is the first time it's been done, and also the, the nearby electrical infrastructure. And that will really serve, serve to sort of prove the play and indicate to the government that, that gas is a good thing. This is a coal fired dominated economy, and um, that, that, that uh, uh, should lead to the availability of project finance for the, um, for the gas fired power station. I mean, there are alternative markets, I and mean, clearly, in the long run, as we as we continue to prove up the play, the most attractive long-term market is in China itself. But there are other local alternatives, such as fertilizer, whose economics have gone through the roof given international gas uh, dynamics uh, that we've been discussing, uh, larger-scale power projects uh, you know, that can be modular in nature, uh, uh, vehicle fuels as well. So you know, this this area, although remote in a Western sense, is proximate to markets and actually got you know, a reasonable degree of infrastructure such as roads and, and, and electricity connections, etc. How many, in terms of the shares, sir, I mean, have you got much local investment into the company? So given the history of how we, we got in, we have local partners and, and they've, they've got some stock and, 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 and have an enduring you know, association with the company um, that, that, that's lasted for, for over a decade. So... Uh, there's very strong alliances uh, in there on on various fronts. What, but what about the Mongolian exchange? Is that is that something that you would consider? It is feasible, and there is some precedent. Um, it's not on our our, our to do list just now. It doesn't really help in any terms of money raising or, or liquidity. It can have some relationship basis locally, but uh, probably not at this stage material enough to, to warrant the investment into that. Right, so in terms of the, the um, commercial back to commercial component, which you, you know you talk about you know, getting some project finance in place, you'd be looking to the usual places then. Because I'm, I'm trying to work out how engaged the government is uh, and how well, I know it's a very small exchange, but you know they're they're starting to build up some um, momentum, I, I, I guess, in country too. So, where do you go for the money, and what what does does the money need to see in terms of contracts in place and the, the values of those contracts? So, the uh, I think the primary sources of project finance for the power project are from the international financial institutions who have got a long and significant history in Mongolia. 
and they are the Asian Development Bank and the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, uh, amongst amongst others. But they're the primary ones. And uh, Mongolia attracts a lot of support from these IFIs, given it's a democracy in a in a region that that where that's rare. Um, and uh, you know, we've been engaging with those bodies for some time. They are there to support the energy transition and, and gas, you know, as we've been discussing, plays a role in that. And we're also talking to those parties about our hydrogen project and uh, they are intensely interested in that. They're, they're very, very keen to support those types of investments. And, and equally, we see them as being sources of project finance for the initial pilot element of the uh, hydrogen project. Well, and, and on to the hydrogen project. It, it, again, a, again, a difficult market for most people to understand because I think they, the, the, the pricing has been hard. Well, sorry, the, the, the cost of production has been hard to understand and the, the, the pricing in the, in, the, in the markets have been hard to understand. But it's one that people look to as, um, well, with energy security being what it is, we kind of need all of the above. So we, you know, everyone wants the hydrogen component to work. What what are you seeing in country which encourages you to believe that one there is margin to be made and, and two the market um, is ready for you? So in in the long term, our hydrogen strategy is the same as for natural gas, and that is to look to the south, the the immediately proximate China, uh, and our analysis uh, indicates that uh, over time they'll have a very substantial need to import hydrogen, and uh, there is nowhere closer and hence lower cost uh, than, than Mongolia. And again, it's got that security of supply benefits um, as for, for natural gas. In terms of costs, we, we closely monitor what's happening in China on the hydrogen front. And, but otherwise, in the Western world, it's really hard to see this, in particular with, with COVID uh, and our travel restrictions. But there's an enormous amount of effort going into green hydrogen value chain uh, in, in China. We've seen recent calculations that indicate that uh, green hydrogen could be produced in the, in the $2 per kilogram sort of range, which is really interesting to compare against uh, international gas prices just now. That's lower than spot LNG prices and close to parity with contract LNG prices. So that, that's absolutely fascinating and, and much quicker than, than many people would have posited. And then to go back to your point about you know people um, you know say where's Mongolia why are you going there we we were enormously pleased to bring in Japan's second largest company um, as a partner and, and they're a fellow long-term investor in the country and we thought that was an enormous validation um, of of Mongolia so it's an early stage partnership only an, an MOU at this point but uh, large Japanese companies don't normally commit. To, to even early stage things like this without thought. And uh, so we thought that was a, a pretty good blessing. Uh, that's SB Energy you're talking about there, right? Yeah, so subsidiary of SoftBank Group, um, and obviously well known for supporting you know, visionary high tech projects around the world, some of which spectacular ses- successes, some of which less so, but which overall have made um, that company in, in a, one of J- Japan's greatest success stories in recent decades. Right. So if, if, I, if I look at the look, look, look at the share price, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's since spring of 2021, it's, it's, it's not been a, a, a pleasant picture to, to look at. But I think you, perhaps the market ran a bit ahead of itself. They got a bit excited about what you were doing. Um, what can what can your current shareholders look forward to? What can new shareholders looking at your project uh, um, expect from you? And what what are the things which are important for you to deliver? Not not these not these kind of marketing announcement type things, but the actual really hard work on the ground things which are important to you as a business, which should be valued. So I, I, I'd say that the key things in the months to come are firstly on the natural gas business, it's to see commercial flow rates from our, our pilot program, which, which is underway. And hopefully we'll see something even by the end of this year on that. Um, on the hydrogen project, we are undertaking a pre-feasibility study, uh, which again should deliver something by the end of the year or early the, st- the next year, and which will then be a catalyst for us and our partner to determine do we form a, a legally binding joint venture and move to uh, feed work on, on the pilot project that we see there. Uh, on the um, project in Queensland, we, uh, as discussed, uh, see it as enormously well-placed to attract a very high-quality partner. 
Um, if that happens, and, and I say we've got multiple funding routes, but if that happens, we would see that occurring within six months. And again, that would be a huge endorsement of the project um, as, as SoftBank has been for, for the hydrogen project. And we, we love to market to, to retail investors and we, and we love trading activity and liquidity. But the true blessing of a project is some hard-headed, um, you know, very well-resourced companies coming into it. Okay. Um, right now, do you think you've kind of got a fair valuation for where you're at and it's really a case of you've got to step up and show the kind of commercialization component in Mongolia um, or find another partner, um, so find a partner, I should say, for the Queensland project. Do, do, do you think those are moments that the market, once you deliver them, should reward you for? Just really a bit, bit, bit blunt, but you know, that, that's, those are the things I, I would look to. Yeah, exactly. Clearly, any CEO is going to say they're undervalued, but you picked up on, on, on the true point, and that is if the catalysts of the type that I've mentioned have delivered, then re-rates should be substantial. And uh, certainly we could point to comparative companies in each of our three spheres who've got market caps in excess of our, of our single market cap just now. So uh, we think that the uh, multi-asset uh, strategy has got the capability of delivering very significant upside, and that can be delivered in various ways, so, so, you know, share price appreciation, sell down, spin out, whatever, and our game is about creating options inside the company and ultimately for shareholders as well.